the Eastern Roman Empire in 562. Under the command of the ingenious general Belisarius and the also very able general Narses, the Eastern Romans had managed to reconquer large parts of the former Western Roman Empire. And indeed, this achievement seemed very impressive. About half of the lost territories of the former Western Roman Empire had been reincorporated into the Eastern Roman Empire, and the city of Rome itself was now again part of that empire. So that we could indeed really call this again, rightfully, the Roman Empire. And if one would see the giant successes of the Romans by 562, one might think that this would continue. That next it was the Visigoths' turn, then the Franks, Burgundians and Alemanni's turn to be conquered one by one by the Eastern Romans. But alas, something entirely different happened. And already in 568, only six years after the final victory of the Eastern Roman forces, the Italian peninsula was invaded by the Lombards. Easily, it seems, almost without any resistance. Did they pour into the peninsula from out of nowhere? How could this have happened? How could the Lombards, out of nowhere, conquer two-thirds of the land area of the Italian peninsula so easily and without any apparent meaningful Roman resistance? When the last organized Ostrogothic army was defeated in late 552 or early 553 at the Battle of Mons Lactarius by the Eastern Roman forces, under command of the very capable eunuch Narses, we might naively think that the Italian peninsula was thus pacified, that the lengthy Gothic war was finally over. And indeed, this is often how it is wrongly shown on many maps. But in reality, even though the Ostrogoths had finally been defeated after this insanely brutal, costly and lengthy 16 year long war, unfortunately many enemies still remained in Italy that were threatening the Romans. First of all, even though the Ostrogothic armies had been defeated, it is very logical that not all Ostrogoths were wiped out, but in fact most of the Ostrogothic inhabitants of course survived, since not everybody was fighting in the army, especially not women, children and the elderly. Thus, even though the Ostrogothic kingdom had ceased to exist after the battle of Mons Lactarius, there were still many Ostrogoths left throughout Italy, who, as you can imagine, were not very fond of the Eastern Romans. Now interestingly, before being defeated in battle, the last king of the Ostrogoths, King Thea, sent envoys to the Franks bidding them for help against the Eastern Roman forces. And indeed, in early 553, a large army of Franks and Alemanni crossed into the Alps as the Alemanni had been under Frankish rule by that time. Initially they had some success, but Narses was a very capable general and so he waited for the right time to engage this new Frankish and Alemannic threat. Until then, as we can imagine, the Franks and Alemanni sacked and plundered cities in northern Italy, an area that was already utterly depopulated and in bad condition after by then almost 20 years of war. The time for engagement came in October 554. Narses surprised the Frankish and Alemanni forces and defeated them decisively with minimal losses at the Battle of the Volturnus River. The losses of the Franks and Alemanni were almost total, while the Eastern Romans, who employed heavily Heruli and other Foederati forces, suffered minimal losses. But even then, the war was still not over. Because what I left out is that the Goths of course helped and supported the Franks and Alemanni wherever they could. 7000 Goths had joined the remainder of the surviving Frankish forces and they held out at Kampsa near Neapolis until Narses besieged them, forcing them to surrender in 555. But even then, the territory north of the Po River was still mostly held by the Franks and the Gothic remnants. And it was incredibly only as late as in 562 that their last strongholds, the cities of Verona and Brixia, were finally subjugated. Now in 562, after 26 incredibly long and brutal years, the war was finally over. But were the Goths all dead? 
Was the entirety of the Gothic nation destroyed? Of course not. Yes, the armies had been defeated. But the majority of the Ostrogothic population, of course, had survived. Some decided to accept the new Roman rule, but others, more rebellious factions, could not accept the fact that their kingdom had come to an end, a kingdom which had lasted for about 60 years, two entire generations. Narses, after these giant victories, retired to Rome, where he oversaw the rebuilding of the Eternal City, with what little funds he received from Constantinople for that task. Narses did order some bridges repaired, as well as the Aurelian walls restored. But most other damages that had been inflicted by the Long War could not be repaired. I talked extensively about the state of the city of Rome in that time and what damages the Gothic War had inflicted on the Eternal City in these videos here. And if you are like me, a total Rome nerd or Romaboo as some people like to say, and I think that you are or else you probably wouldn't be watching this video, then you might be interested in the incredible rings and other Roman accessories which the SPQR shop is building. They make legionary rings, they make rings with different themes, they even make coin replicas, statues, pendants, attributes and terracottas. And the most incredible thing is that they handcraft every single piece. That's right, this is really high quality handcrafted material. There's really no better present for yourself or someone you know who might be a Rome fan. I put the link to their shop in the video description and into the pinned comment. And with this link, you can now even get a 20% rebate for every purchase. I repeat, a 20% price reduction for every purchase from the SPQR shop, which is just an absolutely insane offer. And you can only get it here via the Majorianus link, because let me tell you, the people from SPQR shop also are absolute fans of the heroic Emperor Majorian. So go and check out their incredible sortiment. There will be certainly also something for you. It is said that Narses lived at Rome in the old imperial palace on the Palatine Hill and that the tax burden of the Romans under his rule was very high. Some therefore say that he was recalled by the new emperor Justin II because of his over-the-top taxation of the Romans and forced to retire at Neapolis. The legend is often told that in retaliation for this, Narses himself invited the Lombards into Italy. Many historians, and I also think, that this can safely be placed into the realm of legends. Narses fought years of his life for the restoration of Roman rule in Italy and after his death, which is placed anywhere from 567 to 574, making him very old at the time of his death, in his 90s, his body was even returned to Constantinople, giving him a proper state funeral in presence of the emperor and his wife. This would hardly have happened if Narses had really called for the Lombards. No, something else must have happened, namely the Ostrogoths. Indeed, we already said that the Ostrogoths had trouble giving up the idea of their own kingdom and many of them survived and joined the Franks and the Alemanni. Basically, they tried everything in their power to restore their old kingdom. And when all had failed as late as 562, you can guess for whose help they turned to next. And so it is absolutely no coincidence that the Lombards appeared on the scene out of nowhere only six years after the final defeat of the last Ostrogothic strongholds in Italy. Now we shouldn't forget that the kingdom of the Rugi had become part of the Ostrogothic kingdom under Theoderic. And so when I say the Ostrogoths, I actually also include the Rugi, north of the Alps, whose kingdom was never conquered by the Eastern Romans, because they never advanced so far north. And so the Ostrogoths and Rugi certainly had sent envoys to the Lombards, asking them for help against the Romans. Now ironically, the Lombards had actually been foederati of the Eastern Romans only some years prior. Some Lombards had even fought against the Ostrogoths at the Battle of Taginae, where the Ostrogothic king Totila was killed and which resulted in a total Gothic defeat. And the Lombards also fought as Eastern Roman foederati against the Gepids in 551. 
So it is really ironic that the Ostrogoths had become so desperate that they just asked anyone for help, even old enemies. But the Lombards also sensed a great opportunity. Alboin, who had only become king of the Lombards in 560, sensed that a life in Italy would be much preferable to a life in Pannonia, where the Lombards were settled and where he had to constantly be on the lookout for new threats, such as the rising Avars. And so King Alboin led the Lombards into Italy, where they were greeted by the Ostrogoths as liberators. Thousands of Ostrogoths joined the Lombards in retaking Roman-held cities. So now a completely new people had entered Italy, joined by the remnants of a defeated people, but Italy itself had been utterly depopulated by the over 20 years of war, famine and plague. And please consider supporting this channel via Patreon or YouTube membership because I really need your help in order to be able to continue this work on late Roman history. Without your support, I don't know how much longer I can continue this channel because as you can imagine, the YouTube algorithm does not exactly push a niche topic such as late Roman history. Alternatively, you can help this channel by buying my merch directly here on YouTube. I have created a merch store with some cool or funny or weird late Roman merch, which you can buy directly here via YouTube in the video description. Thank you very much. The lands were empty and desolate and the Eastern Roman forces were spread thin. Narses by that time was 89 years old. He had been old even in the 550s. But now he was simply too old to fight another time against these new invaders. Without a heroic general of the caliber of Belisarius, who had died in 565, or Narses, there was simply no organized Roman defense. And so the first Roman city, Forum Iulii, modern-day Cividale del Friuli, fell into Lombard hands in 569, quite certainly facilitated by the help of the Ostrogoths. Since the Eastern Romans themselves had always the looming Persian threat in the East to worry about, and now the Avars were starting to get stronger and more aggressive, even raiding into the Balkans in 568, and years of famine, plagues and war had also taken a toll on the Roman population, there weren't enough soldiers to hinder the advance of an entire people who were on top aided by the Ostrogothic remnant forces. It is said that even 20,000 Saxon warriors had joined the Lombards. So we are talking about actually four Germanic people fighting against the Eastern Romans, Lombards, Saxons, Ostrogoths and Rugi, since I said before that the Rugi had been part of the Ostrogothic kingdom and thus were allies and certainly also had sent help. And this after the Eastern Romans were weakened and had no able commander such as Belisarius or Narses. Thus, city after city fell to this combined gigantic Germanic assault of four different nations. But even so, there was still impressive resistance. The Eastern Roman navy supplied the coastal cities with provisions, which as a result could then not be taken by sieges and could hold out. And Pavia held out for an incredible three years against the combined Lombard, Saxon, Gothic and Rugi siege. Absolutely incredible and this is often forgotten how only a handful of Eastern Romans held out against such overwhelming forces. Now to make matters worse, not only had the Avars raided deep into the Balkans after 568, but nay, war had broken out again as so often with Persia in 571, thus making it impossible to send enough men against the Germanic invaders of Italy. And let us not even talk about the province of Spania, that also had to be defended against the Visigoths. So the Roman Empire had to effectively fight a four-front war against formidable enemies on all sides, which was just impossible to win. But even so, by 572, the Germanic coalition, as I would correctly call it, rather than purely the Lombards alone, 
had only managed to conquer the areas north of the Po River, which shows exceptional Eastern Roman resilience against a foe vastly superior in numbers. It would take a few more years until the rest of Italy was conquered, and even so, the Lombards never managed to fully conquer Italy. So strong was the Eastern Roman naval superiority and hence the ability to supply coastal cities with enough supplies to withstand any siege. Only in 751 did the Lombards finally manage to conquer Ravenna, where the Eastern Roman exarch had ruled by that time for almost two centuries. And so, when you next time hear about the Lombard invasion of Italy in 568, you will know that it was actually a coalition of Lombards, Saxons, Ostrogoths and Rugi who managed to conquer the weakened, spread out and leaderless Eastern Roman forces. The vastly superior numbers of the Germanic people and the impossibility of the Eastern Romans to fight a forefront war against Persians, Avars, Visigoths and the Germanic invaders in Italy, especially after the plague and the other disasters, allowed the Germanic people to eventually win and for the Lombards to establish their kingdom in 569. I personally think that had the Romans had a genius commander such as Belisarius, with maybe only 10,000 reinforcements from the Emperor at Constantinople, the Lombards would not have managed to establish their kingdom. But we see how incredibly complex in reality many of these Germanic migrations were and what a multitude of people actually took part in them and how massively oversimplified such invasions are then presented 1500 years later in history books. And please like and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon or via a YouTube membership, because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. Because this channel would not work without our amazing Patreon and YouTube members, and I really want to thank each and everyone who is supporting this channel in any way, shape or form. Gratias Tibiago Amiki. And if you want to learn more about the Gothic Wars, I made a three-part series on them. You can watch the first video in the upper right corner. But if you want to learn more about the disastrous consequences of the Gothic Wars for Italy and the Roman Empire, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, Gratias Tibiago and Bene Valete.